You may have heard of climate change. It's so hot right now. No, seriously, it's really hot right now. And certainly it is a big global problem for everyone on Earth. But how does the global become personal? As much as I'm concerned about climate change, as much as I try to reduce my carbon footprint, pressure governments into sensible green policies, and finally get those solar panels, it often doesn't feel like a problem that's right at my doorstep. And that's concerning. Because the more distant this issue seems, the less urgently we act. And the less urgently we act, the more we're screwed. I don't have a perfect answer to this dilemma, but I do have a strategy borrowed from the romantics. Terrify yourself. Not that way. With art. By the way, my name is Nancy Langham Hooper. I'm a PhD, art historian, and cultural enthusiast ready to use the great art of the world to help you out. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe oh. to my channel and ding the notification bell and YouTube will tell you every time I post a video. And not all of them are terrifying, but this one is. Okay, romantics. Now I know that last week we talked about romance in the modern sense, but this time we're going back 200 years to talk about the romantic movement, which was very different. Often, to understand a new trend or a way of thought, you have to look at what came before. So, before Romanticism was the Enlightenment. In the 18th century, people discovered lots of awesome scientific things about the world around them. From physics, to chemistry, to mathematics, to biology, to medicine, discoveries were made that totally changed people's understanding of themselves and their place in nature. Modern science was born at this time, and the arts, music, philosophy, and theology changed as a result. So far, so good. But as often happens, a little knowledge went right to their heads. Somehow they jumped from, amazing, did you know lightning was electrical? To, we can master nature and subdue everything in it for our own ends. Really quickly. So the enlightenment produced this feeling of invincibility and the romantic movement like all new movements, countered that cockiness with a, yeah, but, yeah, we've discovered all this cool stuff, but nature isn't something we can tame. Yeah, we can control many things, but we can't control everything, especially our own mortality. So the romantics emphasized the wildness, the unpredictability of nature that the previous generation had attempted to reason and logic away. They reflected on the huge expanse of the natural world and our own small, insignificant place within it. The resulting feelings of awe, danger, and terror had a name, the sublime. The Romantic movement created names we still recognize in literature. Byron, Shelley, and Keats are taught in every poetry class, and Mary Shelley's gothic horror Frankenstein has never gone out of print. But what about the artists? They captured the spirit of the sublime. A romantic painting is one where you are thrilled, but not quite safe. Romantic landscapes are at an epic scale, making you catch your breath with how big it all is. This is John Martin, by the way, and I'm sure he's inspired many a Hollywood special effects technician. Romantic human subjects emphasize the awesome power of nature and how small and helpless people are by comparison. They are supposed to be a bit dark and a bit terrifying, though Jericho really takes it to new levels. Yeah. But today we're going with something more contemplative, the most famous romantic hero of all, and we don't even see his face. This is Wanderer Above a Sea of Fog by Caspar David Friedrich. You may recognize this. It's the most famous romantic painting out there. We see a man standing on some jagged rocks, his back to us. He wears the activewear of 1818, pants and a frock coat. What? Wool is activewear, right? He steps his left foot up on the rock, leaning ever so slightly on the walking stick in his right hand. Though his red hair twists in the wind, his body is casual, still. He contemplates the scene before him, and it's pretty majestic. The wanderer, or hiker, in German they're the same word, stands above a valley covered in fog. Only the occasional craggy rock juts out the top. The fog obscures, but it reveals too, with trees and other landforms visible where the clouds are thinnest. And in the background, a vast mountain range 
melts into the distance. There are contradictions here. The man is a tiny part of the vast view he contemplates, but he's not a tiny part of this painting. He's the central, unavoidable figure. In fact, Friedrich has made him so central to the composition that certain natural forms seem to emanate from him. Look how the two lines that enclose the foggy valley point to the center of his chest. Some critics have noted that this makes his heart the center of the composition. His head is higher than almost any other element in the painting, save for that one tall mountain. And his feet, which seem to grow out of the rocks he stands on, indicate the casual dominion of all he sees. The man is powerful, confident, possessive. He rises above the foggy valley and can see for miles. But he is still too small to get to those distant mountains quickly. And he is contemplative enough to just stand and stare, to take it all in, the vast beauty of the landscape before him. The three compositional centers of this painting are the wanderer's head, heart, and feet. Logic, emotion, and power. According to our anonymous wanderer, we must bring all three to the contemplation of nature. This painting asks the most important question of the 19th or the 21st century. What is our place in this world? If the Enlightenment emphasized human dominion over nature and the Romantics touted the opposite, then this is an image that seems to fall right in the middle. Who is master here? Nature or humankind? We aren't mere spectators. We are far too powerful for that. The wanderer could be deciding where to put his newfangled railway in this foggy valley. But we are not totally in control. The wanderer could slip and fall. He could be blown off the cliff by a heavy wind, or the fog could engulf his position, blinding him. We have stamped ourselves onto nearly every square meter of this earth. Since the wanderer was first painted above his foggy valley, we have created machines that have slowly belched carbon dioxide and other harmful gases into the atmosphere. Little by little, we changed the vast, untamable earth. But like Frankenstein's monster, we can't necessarily control what we've created. So I encourage you to follow the wanderer's example. Now is the time for some romantic contemplation. Humanity has so much power. It's what got us into this mess in the first place. If we don't tame our monster, it will destroy us. So how can we make climate change feel real, personal? By emulating the romantics in their humility before the natural world by climbing up on a rock, by looking down at a valley, by understanding both our smallness and our power, by feeling the terror of the sublime. We can't totally understand the climate crisis given only facts, statistics, and future projections. We need to open our hearts to emotion. People aren't moved to a cause by cold hard facts. They need their hearts involved if there is to be any real change. The terror and awe that nature inspires in us can help us understand the urgency to act to preserve this wild world of ours, and perhaps be a little less arrogant with its resources in the future. Okay, I hope that helped terrorize you, in a romantic way, into becoming a climate activist. As always, I have links in the description box below if you'd like to know more about Caspar David Friedrich, the Romantic Movement, or climate change. And if this has given you a little anxiety, you can watch my video on that here somewhere. But I also encourage you to look at our wanderer again. He's calm. He's in a rather perilous place, but he knows his own power and the limits of that power. And I'm sure he would say to you, as you joined him on the rock, deep breath, you got this. I'll see you next time. Bye.